Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Kurt Dahl, who is an entertainment lawyer and plays in One Bad Son, which is just a huge, huge band around the world, but particularly in Canada, where uh, Kurt is from. Kurt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Bart. Appreciate it. This is uh, this is a fun one. So we're talking today about um, kind of some legal stuff. So we're talking about copyright law and drums and drum beats and can you copyright a drum beat? I mean, that's really the age old question. Um, and I know it's caused a lot of drama and heartache for a lot of very famous drummers like Ginger Baker and Keith Moon and John Bonham and all these guys. Um, so I'm excited to hear about it. But before we jump in, let me say real quick, I want to give a shout out to the people who recommended this episode. So first off, my personal close you know, Cincinnati guy, guy I played in the band with a uh, friend, Ryan Maloney suggested this to me. And then basically the same week, um, Guy Licata, who is the founder of Reflex Drum Pads, which are just awesome, super popular, great drum pads. We were talking on the phone and uh, just talking about copyright issues in general about manufacturing. And maybe we can touch on that, too. It's a little different than the drum beat thing. But um, so thank you to Guy and thank you to Ryan. Uh, for suggesting this, but it led me down a quick Google search of uh, copyright <laughs> and drum beat and boom, lawyerdrummer.com showed up, which that is you, my friend. So why don't we, why don't we jump in here and just tell us, go back as far as you can about copyright and drum beats and the issues that have been around since the beginning of uh, copyright. Yeah, well, that's, that's a daunting ask, but I'll, I'll, I'll tackle <laughs> sure. it, Bart. <laughs> I like it. Um you know, it's interesting. I think, and I guess w w a starting point, Bart, I would say is, you know, just to clarify, you know, when we're talking about like, can you copyright a drum beat? We're talking about like more on the songwriting side of mm -hmm. things. Like as far as, cause there's two copyrights in every song. There's one in the recording and then one in the actual song itself, like, you know, the, the songwriting. Um, and that, I think we'll come back to that probably a lot today, those two different copyrights. And those are, it's a very important distinction, right? Because on the recording side, you definitely can have a copyright on your performance, mm -hmm. you know, on John Bonham's amazing beat on when the levee breaks, you can damn well bet that that's copyrighted. It's owned by Atlantic records. Right. Yeah. Um, and if you try to like sample, if you sample that iconic drum beat, well then technically you're, you, you need permission or you need to pay a royalty. Right. So, and this is where that gets into sampling and that's a whole other, you yeah. know, uh, discussion, I think. Sure. Right. Um, sampling and recording that's different and that's where you know amazing records like paul's boutique by the beastie boys they had so many samples on there that were not authorized and then like basically uh, paul's boutique could not be recorded today with it'd be too it'd be too much legwork and too many uh licenses to ever become profitable yeah. but um so that's on the recording side now what we're really talking about is like is essentially is drum is drumming songwriting you know can you could i as a drummer go lay down a beat the, the levy breaks drum beat on a new song that my band was recording and get away with it. And from what I, my research, I mean, technically the answer is yes. You know, you, you can, you can't really Bonham or his estate can't really say, Hey, that's his drum beat. You can't go steal that. Um, but I think, if, so if I, if I did go and, and play that exact drum beat on some other music, some other guitar riffs, whatever, I mean, people would call me a hack, you know, and a, and a thief, but yeah, you know, I think what I've found is that I, I don't think his estate could like sue me and say, Hey, you're, you're infringing his copyright. And I guess yeah, the real reason for that Bart is, you know, technically a lot of times in the, in the eyes of the law, drumming is not songwriting. And as a drummer myself and as a lover of drums, I mean, I, I don't like that because I really do think that if you look at, you know, the iconic songs by Zeppelin or the who, or queen or mm -hmm. I mean, even like the chili peppers you know like exactly yeah. the drummer is, or the, the stones or the beat i mean the drummer is such an integral part of the sound and the the, the nature of the songs so I, I feel that drumming is songwriting um yeah and again w w with some bands you know for example the chili peppers they divide all the songwriting equally and including chad smith so sure. they acknowledge that he, he contributes to the writing so 
Um, anyways, I'm going all over the place already, but no, and it's fine. And I want to jump in and I want to throw out there real quick though, before we move on, cause I've had Dylan Wissing on the, on the uh, podcast before who, who his job, it's just interesting about what you said before about, uh, you can go and play like when the levy breaks, what he did an episode about, um, the funky drummer beat, you know, Clyde Stubblefield who did, you know, right, that Clyde. great James Brown. Yeah. What Dylan does though, very, you know, um, uh, it's his job is is a lot of times what he'll do is recreate exactly the sound of uh, the funky drummer beat or, you know, any any you name the the original kind of beat they want to sample. His job is to recreate it with the as close to the perfect snare drum, as close to the perfect preamp into the same board, if possible, to avoid those copyright issues. Um, and I that's again, it's it's on huge, huge songs. I know he's done it with like Alicia Keys and different people who want to use certain beats and recreate it. And uh, and there's no right. legal issue as far as I know. So like so he recreates it without. Yeah. Like, without yeah. having to get a sample, essentially. Exactly. Like he, exactly. Yeah. he remakes. Int- he makes the sample, but does it again and new and with him playing. So you can go and recreate something, get the exact same sound. You know, of course, the same playing, like the same notes are being played. And even the same sound, and then not get a sample or not have to pay. I mean, to me, it just to me it doesn't doesn't sit right with me. And it's not just because I'm a drummer. It's more. It's also because, you know, just like from a legal theory standpoint. I mean, like wh- why can you do that? But if you go and rip off, you know, the the riff to satisfaction, and you recreate Keith Richards, you yeah. know, guitar tone, and and do that riff, well, that is plagiarism. And I think, it, I mean. The answer comes down to, I mean, what do they consider songwriting? I, and I, by by they, I mean, I guess yeah. the music industry as a whole or, sure. or courts of law. Yeah, it's like what is songwriting? You know, basically, they what 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 courts have said is it involves melody and chord structures and and lyrics, mm-hmm. not not drumming. So, um, but yeah, it's, so it's I think that's and that's the heart of our discussion. I think today is like, does that make sense? Should it be that way? I mean, when you when you have you know, Keith Moon playing on I Can See for Miles, like, is that not songwriting? I mean, to me, that makes the song, right? Yeah. And um, and again, it's, I don't think it's just because I'm a drum nerd. No. I think it's I, th- I think it's because I'm a music lover, right? Yeah, like, and, and I, I always think, too, that like you hear about these famous, um, and I can't even, some, I can't even pull one out off the top of my head right now. I feel like there's Chili Peppers songs where they say, oh, that's an exact song that's like, you know, a Tom Petty song. Or there's these songs where they're like sort of close and they go to, you know, fight in court over it because they say that it sounds too similar. And there's been some of them that I hear and I go, actually, I don't really hear that. Like maybe it's the same chord structure or maybe it's this or that. Um, so people do have l- huge legal battles over uh, over sort of sounding similar when it comes to melody and tonal instruments, meaning like guitar and bass and stuff and piano. But um, they're very sensitive about it. But us drummers have to just put up with uh, <laughs> whatever, you know, we, we can't stick up for ourselves. Well, and, and, right. It's interesting. I mean, uh, yeah, I think it was um, Mary Jane's Last Dance, Tom Petty. Yep. And then they said that um, Danny, Danny California, California yep. by the Peppers. And you're right. It sort of has that, you know, kind of that same sort of riff ish, but, but the riff is actually quite different. And then sort of the same, um, delivery in terms of the, the cadence on the vocals, you yeah. know, but, and I, I won't sing the two here cause I'm a drummer and no one wants to hear that, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but you know, you're right. I, I heard that and I was like, well, a little bit, but I don't, I don't really see it. Um, and you're right. So if, if that's sort of like a little bit similar and it's, it's, bringing up possible lawsuits it's you know uh, how can how can the drums be like i copied to the exact note and tone and it's just you have to just accept it and again i think it's sort of the definition of songwriting and yeah so i I get this just as a as a quick aside like i get this question all the time from bands that are, are my clients you know how should we divide songwriting you know and i think that's that's at the heart of this whole discussion is like what constitutes songwriting you know and um and I always say there's sort of like a spectrum when it comes to artists, you know, like on one side of the spectrum is like, you know, like the Bob Dylans or the Neil Youngs of the world who have a band that they sort of hire, but they, they write all the songs, you know, like Bob's not co-writing with anyone typically. Right. Yeah. Um, 
so no songwriting goes to the band, the rhythm section, or even extra guitar players, whatever. It all stays with with Bob or Neil. And then on the other side of the spectrum is bands. It's it's really everyone's contributing. It's sort of like jam based sort of songs, and that would be like the Chili Peppers, where they divide everything equally. Yeah, everyone's bringing ideas, like lyrically, possibly, or or, or maybe just musically. Yeah. Um, and then in the middle is sort of like those bands where it's kind of not neither, but it's like maybe one or two people are sort of. Uh, the main writer, so that'd be like the Rolling Stones, where most of the songs are Mick and Keith, or, or, or the you see them listed as writers, sure. Um, or the Beatles, I mean, it was always Lennon McCartney, and then the occasional Harrison song that would be just strictly him, yeah. Um, and so I, I typically say all bands and fall somewhere on that spectrum, and you just sort of got to find out where you where you sit as a band, yeah. That's um, that's also like what we're talking about. This, you know, for this, in- like this scenario right now is also kind of like an internal struggle for copyright versus external is like um someone else using a beat that sounds kind of like you i mean but it's like you it raises the question of like well you can't copyright like the two four money beat like billy jean you know you're you, like it's just such a interesting thing it's like well then there wouldn't be anything music would stop <laughs> because you can't use that beat anymore i i don't mean music would actually stop but like you'd be kind of you'd run out of uh how many variations can you do it's like you you kind of need to be able to use those and then you can't really pick and choose and go oh okay well uh you can use this beat but you can't use that beat because it's a little more creative like let's say come together or something you know by the beatles that's more tom oriented but like i guess you just can't really pick and choose you know well, and that's and that's a, that's a good a great point. I mean, that's the question, I guess. Can you, yeah, can you differentiate just your standard, you know, four on the floor beat versus when the levy breaks? Well, I mean, you're right. At the end of the day, we don't want every drum beat to be copyrighted because then you're, people would stop making music because they'd be worried they'd get sued and there'd be no new ideas left out there. Um, yeah. except create except crazy, you know, jazz, you know, seven four sure. signature yeah. t- beats, whatever. Yeah. Um, stuff that people can't dance to, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but it's a good question though because I would say, you know, you can't co- you can't copyright just like G C D on the guitar, mm-hmm. you know. Like the but if you do that with a bunch of other chords and then sing a melody to it, you can copyright it, right? It's all of a sudden it becomes, well, whatever. There's so many songs, yeah, <laughs> yeah that I progression. Maybe there could be differentiation, but maybe we don't want it. But I guess what I what I'm saying is, you're right. Your standard four on the floor drum beat, it, I think it could be differentiated from, again, when the levy breaks or the beat on Sunday Bloody Sunday or whatever. But yeah. at the end of the day, you're right. Maybe uh, this is the balance that copyright plays, and it's same with not just drums with with any instrument. It's like you want it there to make sure people don't. If, if you write a great song, you want to be paid for it because otherwise someone could just steal mm-hmm. it. Um, but you don't want it to be too restrictive that it, it sort of hinders creativity. So yeah, I guess yeah. For me, drumming drumming is interesting because I think there is some situations where like that, like the beat is so iconic that maybe there should be protection. I, mean, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing. Now, why don't we maybe go backwards a little bit here and talk about some history stuff? We've obviously named some classic examples where, um, and you know, I think people know this now. Where if I could include audio examples, but the the whole that's a thing too with podcasts and copyright. Where if I start dropping in Sunday Bloody Sunday at the beginning, <laughs> then I guarantee, and within like you know six months or a year, Apple is going to get wise to because a lot of podcasts do have other music, which I think is awesome. But uh, they're going to catch on to it because YouTube, Instagram. I post a lot of drum videos on there, and the second I include more than. I would say honestly, one to two seconds of um, of music outside of the drum beat because I always try to do the drum solos. It it gets flagged for copyright. It's and 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 but the algorithms and all that stuff can't really catch as far as you know at, at August sixteenth, twenty twenty one. They're not really able to catch me pulling off drum solo type things. So interesting. That's even copyright related, you know, so but but man, they take it down fast. Warner Brothers or whoever, if I have like a video and then there's a split second of um, Brian May coming in after Roger Taylor did a drum solo, 
boom, it is taken down. Um, so interesting, but and but just the drum part. If it was just the drum part, it would stay. Up. Yeah, I mean, it's but it's typically a drum solo because there's not too many videos of a famous drummer playing just his drum beat. But um, but yeah, like if right, I, yeah. but I'm, I mean, I'm telling you, like I mean, even like uh, like I remember I posted like an Iron Butterfly video and the drummer was playing. And uh, I think I just had like a, it was like a crash hit and it was like, bah, and I left it in because I was like, they're not going to catch that one note. And it got taken down like instantly. <laughs> so that's so interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah. And it happens all the time. And, you know, I did one the other day where it was Fred Astaire dancing and singing and hitting, uh, kicking the drums and stuff and doing a tap dance thing. And um, I got to pull it up here. It was only taken down in um cuba iran north korea and syria where it wasn't allowed to play fred astaire um kicking and dancing and tap dancing his drums they're like they're just they're not they're not fans of fred, fred astaire, astaire i, guess, I mean but really though i'm kind of curious <laughs> why was it just those four countries that let's be honest sometimes there's some controversial stuff there's political stuff going on but i'm not i'm not sure why that actually um was but Anyway, all that being said, why don't you talk to us a little bit more about how early does this go back to these, these problems? I feel like it kind of pops up a lot in the rock days of the 60s and 70s when drummers were kind of getting into the rock beats. But what, what's your earliest kind of examples of this debate? Well, I mean, it's a good question. I think, you know, it's it really if we're talking about copyright disputes when it comes to music, I mean, because there's not a lot of case law when it comes to the actual drum beat uh you know sort of copyright sure. um but there's a lot of case law in terms of as we've seen even in the recent years you know the led zeppelin case was huge um but that's just plagiarism in general right mm -hmm. that's not and, and again i should say plagiarism is a bit different than what we're talking about to some extent but again i guess what we're saying is could if i again i laid down the you know um when levy breaks beat on my on a, a new song that i'm recording could i be sued for plagiarism i mean the answer is no, but I get. But we, I guess, we are talking about plagiarism to some extent, right? Yeah, but I think um, also that we should we should point out that, like, in the court of public opinion, you would be probably seen as being like, "What the hell is this guy doing?" You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, exactly. Same tempo, same uh, huge drum sound. You'd be kind of like, and you know, there's there's a band Greta Van Fleet who's awesome, but they they oh, sound yeah, a lot yeah. like Zeppelin, and I think that is a thing where it's like, well, it it hurts you to. Uh, and I think they're really cool, but it, it does hurt you a little bit to sound exactly like something in just people's opinions, which isn't legal, but it's a thing. Yeah, well, actually, and, and Greta is a great example of, you know, and this sort of, it's a fascinating debate, I find, like, you know, nothing they're doing is like actual plagiarism. Like, they're not trying to write a song that sounds like Stairway, but the overall aesthetic, the overall feel is definitely Zeppelin. Yeah. I mean, they... You know, even though they try to deny it, I mean, it's pretty. It's like the first thing everyone thinks of, so therefore, it's it's pretty it's pretty obvious. Yeah, um, but maybe but if, that's different. If there's one band who maybe has it coming to them, it's Zeppelin, though, because of the amount of songs that they have taken and kind of like exactly. Well, all the all the all the old blues guys, yep. right? And so that and that's what I joked. I <laughs> one of my website uh, articles, or someone commented like. They're not suing Greta Van Fleet because they've already done it so many times themselves, right? This, and 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 that was sort of part of the. This relates, I guess, to everything we're talking about. I mean, that was part of the history of blues. Was like you you would be influenced by someone else. You take that sort of same song, that same theme, and then just add your twist to it, yeah. right? So, early blues guys were always borrowing stuff off each, someone they saw in the next town or whatever, and then you sort of make it your own. That's why there's so many songs that. Or, or so and so blues, and then everyone do, does their interpretation of it, yeah. right? Um, that just that world is obviously pre. That's a pre copyright world <laughs> where they didn't care. You know, copyright wasn't a thing. They were all just trying to you know pass on the tradition of of blues. Um, yeah. And then we yeah we fast forward into this world we're in now. So I mean, I guess to answer your question, I mean, in terms of copyright issues and and plagiarism cases, I mean they started happening in like. Uh, the 60s, 70s, in the heyday of, you know, what I consider like the golden era of, of rock and roll in many ways, yeah. you know, 60s, 70s. Um, and also in the golden era of the sale of, of recorded music, you know, like, so there's a lot of money at stake. And then what I found recently is in the last five years, the sort of like, there has been a real 
ramp up in, in plagiarism cases that I find fascinating. I always love to write articles on these things and, and compare the two songs because as a lawyer, I find it fascinating, but also as a musician, you know, like comparing, you know, comparing the let stairway to heaven to, uh, was it the Taurus, mm -hmm. um, song? Yeah. You know, like it's, I find it so fascinating because as a player myself, like, you know, there is sort of the argument that everything's been done and there's, there's not, there's no original idea under the sun sort of thing. But that being said, if you rip off stairway to heaven, well then it's clear you're rip, ripping off Zeppelin, but what if they stole it from someone else, which seems to be at least the one progression core progression seemed to be very, very much in, in, in existence prior to what, what page wrote, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyways, I, I find like, I guess what I'm getting at is the, the number of plagiarism cases have increased, I think, in the last several years. And part of it, I think, is because we all of a sudden have every single song in the world at our fingertips. So, so we can very much easily compare the two. And um, I think overall, people, there's going to be more and more of these plagi plagiarism suits because, again, I mean, I think, you know, maybe, I, I don't know, people, are, people like to look to the past for inspiration. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, I think that, that's going to keep happening. And with technology, you can sort of take, take ideas, yeah. you know, like the Pharrell, the Robin Thicke's, you know, uh, song blurred lines with the Marvin Gaye song. I mean, they, they admitted like Pharrell and, and Robin Thicke, and this is why they're, they were found guilt, not guilty, but sure. this is why they lost the case is because they said they admitted like in some interviews that we were going for a Marvin Gaye vibe. We ripped off a Marvin Gaye song. <laughs> like they said that a few <laughs> times. And, um, so I tell my clients, like, if you're going to like try to like rip off the, the aesthetic of a song, don't admit it in an interview, yeah. you know, yeah, uh, no. keep it to yourself. But. Yeah. And, and just to, so people can do their own little research too. So you were talking about Taurus before. So the song Taurus by the band Spirit is like, basically, I think a lot of people think that's where Led Zeppelin kind of got, you know, Jimmy Page maybe got the riffs and the ideas for Stairway to Heaven. So everyone can go and kind of check that out on their own. But, um. So this is like, you know, I, I think it's kind of fun to do episodes like this where, yes, we're talking about drums in general, but I think really it's kind of quickly expanded into like music and songs and copyright. And I was watching something on, I think it was Hulu, where it was all about uh, who let the dogs out. And I'll send you the link, actually, <laughs> Kurt, because it, you'd love it. It was apparently that song has like 20 people who are like adamant that they were the ones who wrote that that rhythm, that who let the dogs out, who, who, and I mean, they have recordings, they have floppy disks of them from their like old MPC kind of like, you know, samplers in like the nineties. And it is like a re That's really good documentary, but it's this, cause it's made a lot of money. Um, and <laughs> it's tons and tons of back and forth, but this can like, this topic of copyright can really tear a band apart. I mean, it can cause friends to family members to hate each other. Um, so it's, it's really emotional. And that, that kind of leads me to, I know famously Ginger Baker is kind of on the record as being very, very angry. And, um, just yeah. with sunshine of your love, um, in particular about he didn't, I don't think he got any songwriting credits. Um, I'm pretty sure at least it, everyone else got, got more as being the singers and the guitarist and bassist. Um, so he is not a happy guy. Well, he was kind of mean and angry in general. I love Ginger Baker, but he's, he's kind of a character. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that didn't help anything um, with famous songs like that. Yeah, you're right. And I remember reading about that too. And, and and again, that's the, with a band like Cream, I mean, they're the kind of band that, you know, we talked about that spectrum earlier in terms of songwriting. And for me, like, that's a band that should have been like a three-way split equal because the, just the sound is so, like some bands, it makes sense that it should, the sound Without one of them, it just wouldn't be the same. And I think that'd be cream. Um, but they just obviously they didn't have that discussion or they did and whatever. They decided that they wouldn't give Ginger any songwriting. But yeah. like some bands, and, and this is what I often say to bands too, like with some bands, you, you don't want to divide things equally. Like, cause then if one person is like not bringing any song ideas to the table and they're, they never show up on time to jam and whatever. I mean, like just giving everyone equal split, uh, equal split does not always make sense, right? Because mm -hmm. it just, it can really, it could create like a freeloader basically. Um, so I think, but with certain bands, again, I look back over the history of rock because that's, that's my language is, is, is rock yep. and roll. Um, like the who, that, that should have been, I mean, Pete, 
Pete did, he was the genius songwriter that brought all the lyrics and, and often, well, and the chords. Yep. But I mean, with Aunt Whistle and, and Keith, I mean, to me, the greatest rhythm section of all time. And then Roger, like this killer vocalist, like th- there could have been an argument that they should have split things equally, but they didn't. And then, like you said, it created an animosity amongst the four of them because Pete, you know, over time, all of a sudden was, had made several million dollars more than the rest of the guys. And so and there's always that sort of element too. Maybe you want to, maybe it helps just create uh, sort of more loyalty to the band or whatever, if you're dividing equally. But yeah, I also think that, and I mean, this is hard to say as a drummer, but like if the guy or girl who is writing and doing a lot of that leg work, there should be a little more compensation on that end. If you're the guy actually, or girl writing the song, bringing the melody, doing all of that stuff. Um, it is, it is very tricky. Yeah. You know what I mean though? It shouldn't maybe automatically yeah. be 33, 33, 33, um, split. If it's three people, you know, the math can <laughs> change, but, uh, so it's gotta be a, a case by case scenario. Totally. And, and, and you're right. And I should clarify, like it, it only, it only makes sense in certain situations where, yeah, the song, like the songs are so they, they couldn't be done without the same, those, those, those same members sort of yeah. thing. And, and I think it also, I mean, with my band, for example, like we all bring in song ideas on the guitar. Uh, we all bring in lyric ideas. We all write together from the, from the ground up. So, you know, we divide everything equally songwriting wise, but you're right. I mean, if there's, if there's times where, yeah, I think if your average, your, your sort of average drummer, I'll put that in quotation mm-hmm. marks, shows up and just plays that lays down a beat t- to songs that have been written outside of their involvement, then that doesn't really, it doesn't seem like songwriting to me. Right. Yeah. So it, it, every situation is so different, you know? And again, just like I said, the Bob Dylan's band, like he brings in songs that are complete and says, here's the chords, you know, add your flair, whatever that means to the song. But you're not a co-writer with me, right? Yeah. yeah. So and yeah. another, uh, so I'm going to link to your article in the show notes here, um, but people can find it by lawyerdrummer.com. And I'm sure it's pretty easy to find there, but there's something here that you, you're talking about. Um, we'll kind of touch on, I just think throughout this, some of these famous, famous songs where you can go, oh yeah, that's an interesting one. We will rock you, which arguably is maybe like, I mean, I have a two year old that, we do that kind of on our, you know, with stomping our foot and clapping our hands. Boom, boom, bap. Arguably yeah. one of the first drum beats you'll ever learn. Obviously, maybe, well, let's say maybe it's the second drum beat you'll ever learn. I think we all know the first one. But it's just so, like, ubiquitous that it's, like, it's hard to copyright that. But what you said here is it seems that a drum beat and something else needs to be added before the piece is considered songwriting. So we do that. We will, we will rock you. So you're adding on that boom, boom. Tsh. Even then you're using the big stadium and the stomping that they're doing, but it's the mixture of those things that, that makes it songwriting, which then ergo songwriting is copyrightable. Yeah, exactly. And, and maybe that sort of hints at or hits at the, um, the nature of drumming. I mean, like we're often, you know, aside from the occasional drum solo, I mean, drummers are often, you know, accompanying uh, other instruments. Right. Yeah. And, um, so maybe that's why, like, maybe it makes sense. Right. If, yeah, just going stomp, stomp, clap, like, is that songwriting or is that like, if so, then like the original caveman that did that, <laughs> we have to track, yeah. track him down. Find his family. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Who is it? Who is it? It's probably like John Bond. Yeah, you know, you know, <laughs> that would be that would make great sense. Ancestor. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, then we add something, and even you're right. Even if it was like in in the verse where Fred Freddie started doing like that, na 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 na, you know, like if you had the same beat and then a different singer, you know, obviously and doing different lyrics, but with that same sort of intonation, um, I think that'd be like okay, this is a rip off, and therefore that's plagiarism, but. Yeah, just the beat itself would not be. So it's um I find it so fascinating, especially at, I'm not a big hip hop guy. I'm re- very not I'm not really a big pop guy. I'm, I'm a rock and roller, sure. but I see I see, in you know pop and hip hop just just rule the the music biz these days and I see that as as a lawyer. Um in those genres like there's so much ripping off of uh, other songs and you know 
So I think there's going to be more and more of these sort of questions brought up is what, and then again, when it comes to the beat too, it's so intriguing because obviously in those two genres, the beat is so important, right? Um, so like, can you take the beat from another hip hop song and then just kind of add your own hip hop, uh, you know, rapping over it or, you know, is that, is that allowed or what? And I, I think we're going to see more and more of those questions and more and more of those, um, those plagiarism cases coming up. Yeah. The whole thing, I just keep thinking like, man, it's such a sticky situation. And then you don't want to, you don't want to like inhibit other people from creating, but I, I think there needs to be a clear, no one, I think ever thinks it's right for someone to like sample the, um, like, let's say the, we will rock you beat. And then like that exact recording, um, and put other music over top of it because that's just not that's really the I guess you know like you said earlier that's copyrightable like that and I'm sure you know this obviously much better than me what is like so how does that work isn't it like a mechanical license if you want to use that what is that kind of stuff where if you did want to use it and you wanted to pay a lot of money you can basically get their permission and pay for it correct yeah exactly so it wouldn't be mechanical like so a mechanical um, for example, my band covered uh, Psycho Killer by the Talking Heads. Um, we sort of did our own take on it. You know, we just threw it. I, I just thought it'd be a cool song to cover, especially with like sort of an updated yeah. view on it, like more of a hard rock view instead of like a Talking Heads view on it. So, um, and then it became like our most listened to song on Spotify. <laughs> so we sort of did it on a whim. But um, so for that, for example, see that. That's where we got a mechanical license. So you just have to go through the, the processes to get a mechanical license, which basically means that when we sell that cover song on iTunes, let's say we sell it for 99 cents, um, nine cents goes to the writers of it, which is the talking head. So David Byrne and hmm. uh, Tina, yeah, whatever, yeah. The, three, the three main writers sure. from talking heads. So, so that's a mechanical. Um, but as far as a sample, I mean, if you're actually sampling a song, so I had this other client release a song that had a sample of a sort of obscure Paul Simon uh, song, which is cool because I'm a huge Paul mm -hmm. Simon fan. And uh, so it was kind of cool. The client's like, I've got the song. I want to sample this little loop from Paul Simon. How do I do it? And so I'd reached out to Paul Simon's like publishing company and it's like, it's called like Paul Simon Publishing in New York City. <laughs> and I got a hold of the lady and she's like, hey, she's like super friendly and She's like, yeah. Uh, and I was like chatting with her. I was like, do you know Paul? He's, she's like, yeah, he comes in every couple of weeks. <laughs> just to, he lives nearby and he comes in and like asks what's happening with his catalog <laughs> and stuff, which I thought was just pretty badass that, you know, she actually knew Paul. Yeah. And then, and then we, so we basically go, we had to go through that process. And when it comes to that, I mean, you can, you have to get approval. So in this situation, we, we played her and I guess in theory, she played to him the sample and um, a lot of times it just goes to the publisher mm -hmm. and the publisher decides if they want to, but, um, and yeah, they ended up approving it. And so then we had to negotiate a fee for that. And then, and then maybe on that new song, if, if the sample is sort of an integral part of the new song, which in hip hop, I mean, sometimes these samples are so, they're a huge part of this, the new song, then you negotiate how much songwriting goes to, in this case, Paul Simon. Yeah. Right. So, so then all of a sudden you're like, you know, I think of all these um, these new songs that like are using old old tracks, you know, and old songwriting. It's such a it's such a windfall for these old artists, right? If they've, you know, if that Paul Simon song became a massive, or the new one became a massive hit, then all of a sudden he just gets this windfall of money, which without having to do anything, right? Yeah, um, pretty nice. So yeah, so the, yeah, so that's how that work in terms of like a sort of a sample situation. This episode is brought to you by Drummer's Hands CBD Balm. Inspired by drummers' wear and tear on their hands, Drummer's Hands CBD Balm is great for targeted pain relief. Drummer's Hands combines the power of full-spectrum CBD with potent herbs including arnica and comfrey. These have been shown to relieve pain, inflammation, help heal bruising, and encourage tissue repair. The combination of these herbs with CBD makes Drummer's Hands a powerful balm. This stuff is great for hands, wrists, forearms, elbows, shoulders, traps, knees, anywhere you're aching. Plus, it smells great. The combination of peppermint, tea tree, and cypress essential oils smells like a minty pine forest. In a base of shea butter, beeswax, and safflower oil, Drummer's Hands CBD Balm is made of all natural and organic ingredients. Small batch, handmade, lab tested, inspired by drummers, made for everyone. Get some at drummershands.com. Use promo code DRUMHISTORY to get free shipping on your order. 
And a quick side note, I've been using a CBD balm on my ankle after I had surgery last October. Uh, and when I started using it, I pretty quickly started seeing results and just helping with the pain and inflammation and all that stuff. So definitely check it out and you'll love it. Good point. Okay. And then I'm also interested too in how it works with if everyone has, let's say, a whatever, like a um, Korg little drum pad or a Dr. Rhythm or whatever, and there's like pre-built in beats in there. And I've heard it a lot where like maybe like there's like a micro synth or something that you hear the same little oscillator kind of thing that I heard the Flaming Lips use and a bunch of people where you're using pre- built uh let's say a drum beat that's like built into like a, a yamaha keyboard or something you you write to it and then you end up loving it and you just kind of put it on the the song anyone else could use that exact same beat because it's it comes built into a a, a brand name a major brand named piece of equipment um synth tones bass you know whatever that's just kind of an interesting thing too of like you if you know if you don't change it or modify it then anyone can use your same you know like if you use an arpeggiator or something it's like well that i guess right you can't copyright anything like that yeah and that's a great question um like in theory and i see this happen too with um so i've got clients of mine that like sell beats online and and i always have to be clear when i'm saying beats because like as a drummer when i say beat i'm talking drum beat mm -hmm. but when i'm talking yeah with hip hop they call you know the beat they call the whole music, sure. right? Like the, the loop or whatever. There's a drum beat, but the, exactly. There's a drum beat, but there's also like keys and could be guitars and bass guitar, whatever. That whole thing is called the beat. Now, I always have to just clarify that because, you know, yeah. when we're talking to, to fellow drummers, a beat means something different totally. than, th than hip hop. So, anyways, they sell beats, hip hop beats. And so I asked the same thing. I'm like, so you, you could, in theory, sell the same beat, the underlying music to like a thousand different hip hop uh, rappers. And then they would have a thousand different songs with the same music, but different vocals. And it's kind of analogous to what you're talking about with the, you know, like they said, like the, the music making apparatus, whatever sure. it is. Um, so with, with these beat companies, a lot of times you can buy the non-exclusive beat or the exclusive mm. beat. And if you buy non-exclusive, then anyone it's cheaper, of course. And then, but other, some other rapper could have the same music and then it kind of makes you look not as cool if, if someone else especially if your song becomes a hit and then all of a sudden yeah. there's another song with that same music. So, mm -hmm. and then you buy the exclusive beat and then no one else can use it, but, and they take it down from the site uh, in theory, once you've bought it. Yeah. So, but that doesn't answer your question, which is, I, I find fascinating. Like, and I'm sure there's been examples over the history of hip hop of got of people that have like taken some sort of like toy, essentially. Like, sure. I've got, I'm looking at one right now in front of me. I've got this, like, I've got this Kawasaki uh, drum making machine in front of me that my kids play with. Yeah. And it actually makes some cool beats. Totally. Like, I, know, I actually like it. Yeah, that's a great point of like, or a organ that has like a, a an old, you know, drum beat that you would play in church or whatever. Like you can hit play on that. And uh, boop, bop, boop, bop, boop, bop. makes me think of like uh, JJ Kale, like uh, Call Me the Breeze. And it's just. Oh, great too. Yeah, yeah, it sounds yeah, like yeah, it's just like a, 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 a kick and a snare looped coming out of like a, you know, an old Hammond organ or something. So, yeah. And that's like, I think in those situations, it's interesting. I mean, I think you could probably, well, I don't think for Kawasaki in my example would come back and say, Hey, you, that's our beat, but <laughs> no. yeah, it's interesting. I mean, in theory, yeah. In theory, someone else could replicate it if they wanted. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you better get to writing immediately with your, with your toy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, it's the tone. I guess it, it's uh, it's also like, um, you know, everyone in every city knows probably in some scenario where there's a band where there's maybe a couple bands who have like the same name where it's just a coincidence. I've, I've seen that like growing up with a couple bands. And then like it's almost like whoever gets there first and gets biggest kind of gets the claim on 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 whatever, maybe the song or the band, you know, like um the band yeah. name but so maybe it's kind of like a, oh you're copying um song x if you're using this kawasaki toy drum and it's like you know well if they did it first then um you you stake your claim yeah and, and that's a great point I, I always say it's sort of like first to market we, we, yes, we say exactly. that right like it, it it's same with uh like certain ideas right like if you've invented something you know like there was other companies that ha came out with MP3 players before, 
you know, Apple came out with like the iPod, but what, what Apple went to market first with like the best, yeah. right? So everyone, all of a sudden, all the other MP3 players were just dead, you know, yeah. dead to the world because, you know, it was just, yeah, that's exactly it right. It was just the best. Yeah. That was a weird period with, with all those MP3 players that were just kind of hard to connect and it would <laughs> like, uh, it would like never quite work right. And it would hold like 10 songs <laughs> and you'd like get one for like a birthday or Christmas present. And it just, like never got used. Um, th- those were the days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they get they could hold like two albums. Yes. You, had to, you had to like you had to pick your best two albums and just keep cycling through. Yeah, them. yeah. All right. So I have a couple more questions. Uh, kind of they're they're both very different. So I'll start with one that's uh, on topic of everything we've been talking about. How can a drummer maybe let's assume that they have a little bit of musical ability on on other you know instruments. Um, what can a drummer do to make themselves be more uh, proactive in the songwriting process or just more, you know, uh, not have to deal with these problems of let's say you do work playing a band and there's a bunch of copyright issues um, and you don't want to just be the, you know, it's the age old story of like um the the drummer is driving in like a Ford Taurus or something and the singer's in a Ferrari. Um, not that there's anything wrong with Ford Tauruses, but um, <laughs> of course. But, you know, just as an enter- entertainment lawyer, what should drummers do to maybe stick up for themselves? Or what can they say to like, you know, say, no, 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 I did contribute for this arrangement. Like, I don't really play. I can play other instruments, but in bands, I have never really said like, I got a riff. I mean, I kind of have, but it's more like, hey, let's go to A and then C and then back to B and then do the bridge. And I would contribute like that. What should we as drummers do to kind of get our, our stick our neck out a little bit and say, I want to be on the credits? Well, and it's a great question. I mean, I, it really depends on the band, right? I mean, like, again, if, if you're, if you're, well, if you're the Chili Peppers, I mean Chad Smith, you know he's, he's always there, writing from the outset, mm-hmm. kind of like jamming with whether Flea or Fushante, whoever whoever's in the band on guitar, yeah. um, you know. But then if you're if you're sort of if you're Charlie Watts, I mean, you know Keith and Mick are working away on songs and they bring it in and then Charlie lays down his thing and so it wouldn't make sense for him to be like, hey, I want to be there when you're when you're you know strumming on guitar. Yeah, sure. Um, it's really I don't know. Band dynamics are so interesting and. And I, I know that firsthand because I've been in one for, well, One Bad Son's been together for 17 years and I was in a band before that for another six years. Mm-hmm. And, like, you know, band dynamics, are, I, we, we could do a whole podcast on band dynamics, yeah. you know. Um, but so I guess, I mean, really, to me, I think like some drummers such as myself, you know, can can write songs, write, you know, on, on guitar I think that does help because I mean, if, if we look at just the the, sh- the the strict definition of songwriting, I mean, it really you know if you if you're strumming chords on a guitar with your other band members, then you're you're helping shape those chords, and that that could definitely be more songwriting. Um, but uh, let's say you're not, you, you you can't play guitar or you don't want to or whatever. Um, I mean, I think just contributing to the overall vision of where the song's going, I, I think is, is quite helpful. Yeah. Right. I think that's, that's um, a great point. Let me, let me ask this too. So we, we talk about this of like credits and songwriting credits and, and all this stuff. And, and I've done some, uh, as an engineer recordings with this group that I've worked with for a long time, just for work where they call me in and I engineer it. And, uh, and before I leave one of the fam, the, it's a family of, of musicians and they are already, uh, putting my information in, as the engineer on like all music or like whatever ASCAP and all these things. And they're, they're, they're on it. So why don't you explain a little bit about what actually it's not just like, you know, um, your guitar, your singer, Joe is like writing on a piece of paper. I sang, I wrote this song. What does that actually do? Like, where do you actually like that whole back end of like kind of the credits and all that stuff? How does that work? Yeah, it's, it's 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 quite important. Like it's more important to be registered with, you know, ASCAP or BMI or in Canada it's called SOCAN. Like that's way more important than being listed on the CD, you know, yeah. like or I guess or on the website or on Spotify. Like sure. you know, like actual credit in terms of like outward recognition doesn't matter ne- nearly as much as actually being registered, right? So um 
So yeah, I mean, I mean, you lot you become a member of either ASCAP or BMI in uh, in America and SoCan in Canada, and you register the songs, right? So as a band, if you say you got a ten song album, you go and register all those ten songs with the appropriate writers and then the splits, and then in theory, like every time that song gets performed anywhere, like it could be on radio, it could be in a mall, it could be at at a, in a movie whatever like anytime that song is performed you w- will get paid yeah. as a writer so um I, I feel like songwriting is and i've said this often like in the last few years like to different well on, on in interviews and on podcasts i mean songwriting has never been more valuable because mm-hmm. you know we talked again about the two copyrights is, is in the recording and in the songwriting and in the golden days like in the old days when, when records sold like crazy uh, you had million selling selling records like that generated money for the the copyright the sound recording copyright. Um, so if you own the if you if your record label, that's when you made all the money. Um, these days, records don't sell like they used to, of course. But music is being used and performed more than ever, mm-hmm. right? So that generates money for whoever wrote the songs. So being a songwriter, like it's just never been more valuable. And and I've I do a lot of big negotiations for big publishing deals and that's dealing with, you know, songwriting. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's never been a better time to be a songwriter. So as a drummer, again, if you can contribute to the songwriting and it's in a, in a real and, and meaningful way, then I, I highly recommend it. Yeah. And maybe this is like a call to action for drummers out there who do contribute, who maybe aren't as business minded for them to kind of maybe like look at the back end and like, you know, maybe have a discussion with, let's say the guitarist or the singer is the one who's actually submitting, um, for the licensing or whatever for, for ASCAP or BMI or wherever you are in the world to maybe speak up and say, Hey, what's the share? Like, cause maybe you, you've been naive up until this point and you're not really on top of the actual, like who's getting what, because it's kind of, it's never, I mean, maybe it is if you just, you need to get it out of the way. You need to have the conversation, be done with it, move on. So maybe this is, if you're listening to this and that's you, maybe this is a wake up call to kind of like, be like, wait, what is this percentage? Because people who are much, much, much smarter than me, who are massive, humongous, world renowned musicians have had battles and legal issues that are of legend. Um, So if they have trouble with it, (laughs) then i imagine if you're like me maybe it's like oh it's time to look at this um if if you're in a position where you never know a song could blow up so get ahead of it yeah i think you're so right bart and like at the heart of it is just have the discussion right like and i think these are like band discussions that i always recommend be had um and it's not only bands i mean it also could be just co-writing with someone else that's not in your band or whatever i mean have these open and honest discussions because it's like it happens all the time where a song does start blowing up and then you try to have these discussions and you find out actually no we're not giving you any songwriting because you're just the drummer quote unquote yeah and then it's like oh well that wasn't my understanding i thought that i was contributing you know yeah and then it gets kind of messy you know and i think that i mean just like any relationship it's like open communication is key um if you're in a band especially like you got to have these discussions otherwise it's just gonna be awkward when someday you need to have the discussions instead of doing them, you know, voluntarily. So um, it just, it makes things, instead of making it sort of awkward, I think it actually makes it less awkward by having the discussion. Yeah, I would agree completely. I mean, you, you're saving yourself a whole bunch of, uh, of, of heartache um, down the road. Um, so, all right. And then what I was talking about before about having a, a question that was completely, uh, you know, kind of different than this performance based stuff is we've had some discussion on the podcast before about um, issues and things with copyright and uh, and trademark stuff, which I don't think that's I think sometimes people confuse copyright and trademark. So maybe we can kind of define that a little bit as well. But um, with brands where or the lug casing on a DW kit with the turret kind of round um, lug. And then at the same time, Heyman drums in England were using that same round badge. And there's once you go across the ocean, you kind of have to have these these. It's more of a patent thing, which I realize is a completely different, you know, field of law. 
But um, we've talked about that on the show before where there's, you know, if you're in business and you're you got to you got to stay on top of these these patents and there's bootleggers making things. I know the pro logics guys, uh, the practice pads were talking about people bootlegging it in China and selling it on, uh, I think, Amazon. So that whole thing of copyright and patent and trademark um, is is a whole world in itself. Do you, you ever have any experience with stuff like that? Yeah, we do. Like we do a lot of trademarks, uh, patents, mm-hmm. like not so much because for patent, you have to like be a patent agent. Yeah. Um, and it's more like more of a science background. But I mean, there's people Yeah, you know, I, I refer like I've got clients that do want to get a patent. And I just refer them somewhere else. But um, but yeah, I think it's really, you know, um, for trademarks, that's different. Like if you got a brand, you got to protect it. Right. So go back to the Rolling Stones because they're, they're just a great reference yeah. band. Um, you know, the Stones, it's like they, you can bet they've, they make millions and millions a year from, you know, the tongue, the tongue and lips logo. Um, plus they probably have several trademarks you know, on the name itself, but also, you know, I'm sure they've got tons of different things. They, they've got trademarks. So, um, same with ACDC, like, you know, that, that logo is, you bet that's making millions a year. And I think at some point, if your band is succeeding, like it makes definitely makes sense to trademark your, your band name. Yeah. And there you hear those stories too, about, um, like, what is it where like the Nike logo, they paid the the woman who designed it like $30 or something like that. Um, I can't remember oh, really? exactly what it was, but it was something like that where, Jesus. um, artists, everyone needs to just like, but you know, I mean, to be perfectly honest, um, you don't think like that up front. You don't, it's sometimes it's hard to think like, oh, this band is going to be, I'll do your logo and then I'll, yeah, you pay me work for hire or whatever. Um, I guess it's just important to really treat everything like it could be huge and, and, and have paperwork and protect yourself. Um, you know, which is easier said than done sometimes on a daily basis. Uh, yeah, I find in general, I mean, what I think a lot of people, and this goes for your U S listeners as well, like reach out to me, reach out to any entertainment lawyer that you trust with, with questions, right? Like, you know, I'm not, I think people don't, they're afraid to reach out to lawyers because they're worried about getting like a big bill or something in the mail. That doesn't happen. Like, I mean, that doesn't happen with me anyways. I mean, yeah. if you got a question, shoot me an email, go to lawyerdrummer.com, shoot me a message. And like wherever you're at in your career, it may make sense to have like to get a contract, to get a co-writer agreement or a band agreement or whatever, or maybe it doesn't. Maybe I say, don't worry about it right now. You're, you're probably safe to not have anything. And at least you get that peace of mind, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you hear their band to go, uh, dude, I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, now, um, so what is a typical breakdown? Like I'm talking like, you know, um, an average of how it works with let's not say, I mean, I, I, I know there's bands like the Chili Peppers or where they're they're like they're like brothers. They're like they've been through everything together. They're going to do it, you know, 20, 25 members, 20, 20, 20, 20. And and. But what is a typical breakdown of a band that's, you know, very tight, all that stuff, but the singer writes most of the songs, the guitarist comes up with his guitar riffs, kind of a a prototypical band, and the drummer does contribute a little bit. They're really a member um, of the band. But what is a typical breakdown of percentages that you you see in those cases? Well, I mean, again, like it's it really it's that I go back to that spectrum because it really like a lot of times I do see equal split across the board. Um, if that makes sense, then a lot of times I'll see again, sort of the Bob Dylan model where it's like one person's doing everything. They're bringing songs fully developed into the band and then saying to the band, like, you know, play your instrument on this and let's make it a recording and they get nothing. Um, and then I do see like the stone sort of setups where it's like two people are doing all the work, all the writing. And they have like a rhythm section, for example, who doesn't do the writing. Sure. And, um, but then again, that's where I think you need a band agreement because if you're in a band, because when it comes to live revenues like that, you almost always like live revenues are split equally because everyone's out on the road making the same sacrifices mm. or whatever, right? Gotcha. Um, but but not always. Sometimes like one member's invested a bunch of money or one member bought the van or, or whatever, or or one member's like the real it's their their band and they've got sort of hired guns on tour with them. So it really, it really depends on the situation, but which I know is a very lawyerly answer, yeah, but right. it really is yeah. like, I've just seen it. I've seen, 
I say this all the time that there's no two bands that are the same. And I mean that like, um, even if you look at the, 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 the big bands that I gave as examples, like they're all so different, right? I mean, the who is so different than the stones and they're so different than the Beatles. And, you know, uh, they're so different than Pearl jam, you know, like yeah. it's, it's all over the map. So I think the important thing at the outset, again, is have these discussions and say, listen, I think we should be splitting equal songwriting or, or I don't think we should like whatever the case is, um, have those discussions, you know? Yeah. Well, and then that raises the question too of, uh, when it comes to recordings. Um, so I personally have played on, you know, a ton of sessions, just being a guy who works at a studio and I'm, I'm there and they use me as a drummer. So I've done a fair amount of like, you know, Hey, come down and play on these people's, um, you know, songs. I sign something that's like a work for hire. That's like, you're getting $50 an hour guarantee of two hours, which, you know, Again, just for like a Tuesday for an hour, you get a hundred bucks. That's great. But um, there's some that I've done where they're like commercial things where they play on TV and radio like 20 times a day. And um, I made a hundred bucks and but it's playing constantly. I realize, though, it's like a radio thing. It's like a brand and it's like a commercial. It's got to be different, though, if you are um, like Ash Sohn or one of these huge Matt Chamberlain where you're playing on these mega records in those cases, do they typically get like a percentage of the sales or Josh Freese or whoever, like, you know, these session Goliaths? How does that typically work with like breakdowns that, that you're aware of? Do they get more of a percentage of the the physical copies sold? What I find in those situations, they, I doubt they would almost without exception, I doubt they'd get a cut of like record sales. I mean, maybe if they were, you know, in some situations, but I, I don't think that's the norm, but what they sh would get and what's a really important revenue stream, even for like anyone, like you said, you pl you're playing on stuff that's going to be in commercials unless they, unless they try to get you to waive these rights, um, you like get, you should get your neighboring rights royalties. So, so neighboring rights, like that's a lot of times you get sound exchange revenues. Mm. So, um, so like Actra and BMI pay the songwriters, but you know, neighboring rights cover the performers on a recording. Mm. So as a drummer, like if you're not the songwriter, then okay, that, fine, we can accept that. But you should be getting performance uh, performance revenue. So from from uh, sound exchange, et cetera. So um, I would say just do some, do some research on neighboring rights and make sure like when you register – like like sound exchange has set aside like they've said that a producer is is a performer the, you know, the main vocalist is a performer but also like the side musicians are performers so like you're entitled to those revenues and like i've got some clients who and they're not even like household name clients they're they made like 80 grand last year on sound exchange <laughs> revenue wow. so um if and a lot of that comes from if you get played on satellite radio like on sirius xm so again it, you know if you're doing a bunch of session work as a drummer I think you should look into neighboring rights and see if you see if you should get a cut of that for sure. Yeah. Well, I'm just looking at this. And again, I'm not trying to rock the boat or anything. I'm just it's just interesting because it says, uh, you know, without further comp, blah, 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 exclusively without further compensation, royalties, residuals and or any other payments or consideration otherwise uh, expressed therein. And this is just something where like every musician who plays on them comes in and just I guess that's more of a straight work for hire. You came in, you played for two hours you got paid, it ends there, which I have to right, think is yeah. fairly common because, I mean, again, these are like, you know, pretty cut and dry sessions. That being said, there are other sessions that happen that are um, that I've never actually done one, but where they're like um, union and they they pay differently for singers and stuff. Um, but that's not the case with these. So maybe I need to think about it in my life more. <laughs> and maybe in some situations they want you to waive these rights so you're, you're not going to get any cut of those. But yeah. I think overall, I mean, I, I think you should be entitled to that. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I got a legal battle to fight here. Um, so, <laughs> well, why don't we, uh, I mean, this has just been awesome. The time just flew by and there's, there's, this is a cool episode did, that, yeah. that is just chock full of stuff. Um, so, um, Kurt is kind enough to maybe hang out for another couple minutes here. And Kurt, what I'd love to talk about maybe is just like talk some drum and hear about your, you know, your kit and all this stuff and maybe like what you, what you play and uh, maybe you as a drummer for, you know, 10 minutes or whatever and, and your gear. And we can talk about uh, maybe some cool cases that you've 
worked on or maybe some issues that have come up with real life scenarios with, you know, obviously not Zeppelin and the who and stuff. I'm I'm imagining in in your situation, but like, like, you know, real deal everyday um, musicians who are battling it. So if you're okay, Kurt, I'd love to have you stick around after this and, and we'll have that little bonus talk. That'd be great. Yeah, I'd love it. Cool. So if you want to hear that bonus conversation or anything else, you guys can go to drumhistorypodcast.com and click the um, Patreon bonus link. And um, once you're there, you'll see kind of, you know, months and months of back back to episodes, which are really, really cool. So um, yeah, Kurt, why don't you uh, plug your band a little bit here, your website where people can find you if they have like a legal question and might lead to a client and it might lead to the next uh we will rock you or something like that where can people find you <laughs> yeah. all that stuff yeah and honestly the easiest is just like just go to lawyerdrummer.com uh or just on instagram just lawyer drummer and like i mean the big thing i think part of what's got me you know some followers around the world is i'm always writing articles on you know cutting edge issues in the music biz right and I, I started doing this like a decade ago and, and no one cared at first sure. and I kept doing it for a decade. And what I realized is that like a lot of lawyers out there don't want to share this information because for whatever reason, I, I don't know why, maybe they don't, they don't think they should share it or whatever. I mean, to me, I had all these questions about the music biz, you know, like, should I give my producer songwriting credits or, you know, what constitutes songwriting, you know, yeah. and I couldn't find the answer. So I thought, well, I better, I better change that. So I wrote the articles, did the research, and now the articles get like as you saw when you searched. You know, yeah. my my site came up, which is to me it blows my mind because again, it started with very humble beginnings. Yeah. So, anyways, I mean, I think there'll be lots of articles. Just go to the articles tab, and there's probably a ton of articles that are going to apply to you, whoever is listening out there. Yeah. And yeah, I'm happy to help and shoot me a message and. People are often surprised that they message me and I get back to them. So, well, you know, and and honestly, yeah. I like looking at your at this article, and it's almost like when you're looking at a recipe. I always go down to the comments and see someone says, "Whoa, that was way too much salt. Don't put that much in." So, on your site, I like going down <laughs> and looking at the comments, and you're pretty much answering everyone. People are having really good questions, and um, you know, just like, what about MIDI beats? What about copying this? And and you're really kind of communicating with people here. Um, so all about that community. I mean, that's, that's how drummers, drummers roll. So I'm, I'm glad you're, you're keeping it going on, on your website. Um, <laughs> well, thanks. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. And again, that's lawyerdrummer.com and it's, uh, Kurt Dahl. And then what about your band? Where can people find your band? Yeah. So, I mean, one bad son, I mean, check us out on Spotify or YouTube and yeah, we've, you know, if you like rock and roll, like in the vein of, I don't know, Zeppelin or Soundgarden or whatever. I mean, like we're, we're a hard rock band. So yeah, check it out. Yeah, cool. One Bad Son, S-O-N. Um, I will be listening tonight and uh, and uh, enjoying it with, I'll, I'll, you know, have my son. He loves to listen to heavy stuff and jump around. So we'll do that. But um, okay, <laughs> everyone, uh, again, check out the Patreon bonus episode. And uh, yeah, Kurt, thank you for being here. Thanks so much, Bart. Appreciate it, man. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.